Hi, great to be with you. Wasn't it good just to worship together and just sing our praises unto God? We're going to look around at the Word of God again this morning and we're going to look at um, altars. We were looking at without an altar, nothing altars. And so we're going to continue the journey with Abraham and the way that Abraham throughout his life built altars. But before we do that, let's pray. Lord, I thank you for the, your word. I thank you for the time that we have to come around your word this morning. I pray, Lord God, that you would lead us and guide us by your Holy Spirit. Your word is living and active. It is true. Lord, your word says that it will not return void, but it will accomplish that that you have sent it to do. So this morning, as we come around your word, Lord, I pray that each one of us would hear what you want to say to us. Lord, that not only would we be hearers, but we might become doers of the word of God. So leaders and directors, Lord, be glorified in it and through it, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we've looked at a couple of the altars that Abraham built. We looked that God called him out from the era of Chaldean and, uh, of course, he settled with his father. But then God called him to move on to Canaan. And he set up an altar when he moved on. And we call that the altar of promise and the altar of obedience because he stepped out in God and God promised uh, what he would do for Abraham and so Abraham stepped into that place with God and then he moved on from there and he set up uh, an altar between Bethel and Ai and there he built an altar a, pr a prayer a place to call upon God and the word of God says that he called upon God there and he heard God but then a famine came and Abraham looked for a natural solution instead of trusting the promise of God. And so he went down to Egypt. And he should have never gone to Egypt. The word of God says that he sojourned, which means he went off road. It was not the road that God had called him to walk upon. And, but, he, but he decided that there was an issue and it needed to solve and this was a solution so he was going to take it because there was no famine in Egypt so he took his family and Lot's family down there and well uh, there were problems and not only did he have a problem down there but actually we'll see further down the line the problems that uh, he came back with from Egypt so God brought him back to that same altar of prayer, brought him back to Bethel, the place of God. And he once again sought God, sought to hear God, sought to understand what God wanted to say to him. And, and, and we looked at that as being a place of repentance, didn't we? Because, you know, there are times in our life where we go off road. There are times in our life when we take our own way. There are times in our life when Egypt represents the world where we've probably got drawn to the world for its solutions instead of listening to God's promises. And, uh, and God brought Abraham back to this altar of prayer. And the word of God says that God is able to turn all things round for good. To those who love him and accorded, call, called according to his plan and purpose. And God is able to do that. If we come back to him with a heart of repentance and say, Lord, I messed up. Lord, I've got it wrong. You know, God is able to bring those things back round and bring us back onto the path that he wants us to walk. You know, so often we ask God to bless our ways instead of actually walking in the ways that God has put before us. Here we ask him to bless our plans instead of us living in his plan for our lives. So he came back from Egypt, he came back to the, the altar and he came back to God and God repurposed his life and 
how, how gracious is God that he so often repurposes our life in God, doesn't he? And brings us back to that place and puts us back together. So this week I want to look at the third altar that Abraham built. And I've called this the altar of separation. Because Abraham had to separate from Lot. When he came back from Egypt, uh, they came back with lots of things. They came back with more people. They came back with more animals. They came back with more wealth. They came back with more problems. And, um, and Abraham had to separate from Lot. The herdsmen were falling out with each other. And so Abraham said, look, we need to separate. And there is a time, friends, in our lives where we need to make sure that we separate from things that are not good in our lives. And, and so they stood there and Abraham said to Lot, look, if you want to go that way, I'll go that way. If you want to go that way, I'll go that way. And Lot looked with his eyes down to the valley. Chapter 13, verse 9, we're, we're, we're around there. And he looked down and uh, he looked into the valley and it looked lush and it looked beautiful and there was plenty of water. And Lot thought, wow, that's where I'm going. Look, there's Sodom and Gomorrah there, big cities. And, and, and wow, yeah, I am going there. And so he said to Abraham, that's where I want to be. And Abraham said, that's fine. He says, if you go that way, I'm going this way. And Lot looked with his eyes at the world and he, he was caught by the, the glistening lights of the city and the lushness of the place. And he was pulled in to the same place as Sodom and Gomorrah. And the word of God says that it, it looked lush like Egypt. And so often the world looks to be a good place to be, doesn't it? So often it, it, it looks as though that would be the, the easiest place to be. But so often, well, always, the world leaves us empty, as it would prove to do for Lot, just a little time further on. And so he went down into the valley. But it says there it, were the men of Sodom who were exceedingly wicked, wicked and sinners against God. Sodom and Gomorrah were not good places. And so um, and so Abraham decided to separate from Lot. Three times the word of God says that he separated from Lot or God told him to. And then it says this, it says in verse 14 of that chapter it says then after he had done that, God spoke to him. You know, there are times when we want to hear from God, because remember, he had gone back to the place to hear from God. Gone back to this altar of prayer. But there are times when we come to God in prayer and it just feels as though God's not speaking. You know, and and and. Maybe one of those reasons is sometimes we, we need to separate ourselves from certain things. Maybe we've got drawn in to a place that we shouldn't be. Maybe, uh, maybe our language is not, not what it should be. Maybe our attitude, whatever it is. But, but it, it's at that altar when we come and we separate and we, we leave those things behind that then God speaks to us. And that's what happened here. It says, then after he had done that, God spoke to him. And, and it says here in verse 14, the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, now lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward, southwards, eastward, westward, for all the land which you see, I will give it to you and to your descendants forever. I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth. So that if anyone can count the dust of the earth, then your descendants can also be counted and numbered. Arise, walk about the land through its length and breadth, for I will give it to you. Then Abraham moved his tent and came to dwell by the oaks of 
Mom, and which are in Hebron, and there he built an altar to the Lord. There he built an altar to the Lord. You know, there's a couple of things that I felt prompted by the Holy Spirit to say here. The first one being this, that within there it says, Now lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are. I believe God wants us to lift up our heads, to lift up our eyes and to the hills from whence comes our salvation, to look unto God. You know, so often when we are in a situation or a circumstance, we, we become overwhelmed by it. And, and certainly over this past time, um, we've become a little bit too focused on, on the situation, haven't we? Now, is it real? Yes. But is our God the answer? Yes. God is still in control. You know, and God wants us to lift up our heads and lift up our hearts to him. Whatever situation and circumstance it might be, it may have nothing to do with the virus. It might have something to do with finance or health or whatever. But I felt, I just felt in my spirit, God saying, now lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are. And, uh, and that's what Abraham had to do. He had to lift up his eyes. And as he lifted up, you know, he, he began to see the stars in the heaven. And he began to see creator God in, in all of his might and power. And realise actually that, that, that God was in control. And God says to him, to the north, to the south, to the east, to the west, I'm going to give you all of this land. But here's the second thing that I, I felt God say, that, that to do that, we have to arise the word of God says that Abraham had to arise. Faith always, always requires action. Let me say that again. <laughs> Faith always requires action. And so he had to arise to be able to do that and to take possession of what God had promised him. God told him to arise and to walk around the land. And so Abraham had to do what God had told him. And so he got up and he walked around. But it says this, that, that he moved his tent and he came to a place called um, Mamre. M-A-M-R-E. Which means a place of plenty, a place of fatness, a place of strength. And it was next to Ebron, which means an, a, a place of association or relationship uh, a place of friendship and of course Abraham was called a friend of God and so God was God was bringing him into a place of relationship with him and God was bringing him from a place of weakness into a place of strength uh, from a place uh, of famine into a place of plenty and God wanted to um, God wanted to bring Abraham into that promised place. And in fact, this was to become Abraham's base. He would travel out from there and come back there. And Abram would be his final resting place. When he finally went home to be with God, that would be his resting place. But there he built an altar. There he built this altar that would remind him the, the need for separation and that as, as we separate from those things that so easily entangle us we'll come to a place in God where we focus upon him and we are dependent upon him and he leads us into a different place God wants to lead you and he wants to lead me and he wants to lead us into a different place in him a place of strength a place of plenty a place of relationship with him and with one another. There he built an altar that would remind him of what God had said to him. It was a place of intimacy. It was a place where he would hear God. Now I just want to cover two more things this morning. What happened a little bit further on is that four kings 
came down. In fact, Genesis 14 tells us the story. Four kings came down from the north, from the air of Chaldeans, to conquer the southern territories. And they took on five kings and they defeated the five kings. And somebody came to uh, Abraham with a message to say that what had happened and they'd taken Lot and his families and all his possessions and they were heading back north. So Abraham rose up with 380 men and set out. I find that incredible, don't, don't you? You know, these four kings with all their armies have come down and beaten five kings and Abraham sets off with 380 men. And Abraham defeats the four kings. <laughs> and um, and on his way on his way back, uh, Abraham carry, uh, travels through the king's valley. Now, as he's travelling through the king's valley, the king of Sodom comes out to meet him. Now you can you can, you can read that. In, uh, cha in chapter 14, verse 17, it says, Then after it is returned from the defeat of uh, 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 the kings, uh, that the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of the kings. And Melchizedek, the king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Now he was a priest of God most high. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave him a tenth of all. Now, the king of Sodom came out, but also the king of Salem came out to meet him in the Valley of Kings. And he meets... Melchizedek, which means the king of righteousness. And he is the king of uh, Solomon, which is the king of peace. And here are two complete different kings. There's the king of um, Sodom, and there's the king of Salem, right? One means solemn, um, solemn means a place of burning, <laughs> and the other, the other means a place of peace. And here we have these two, two kings. Now he meets up, and Melchizedek comes out to him, and Melchizedek brings him bread and wine. Now, I find that very interesting, that he brings him out bread and wine. Because when I, when I read that, it reminds me of Jesus, our righteousness, the King of righteousness. It reminds me of Jesus, the, the Prince of Peace. And, and some believe that uh, Melchizedek was a type of Christ. And in fact, if we read in the book of Hebrews, the book of Hebrews tells us more about Melchizedek than it tells in, here in the Old Testament, in the book of Genesis, and is mentioned again in the book of Psalms. But Hebrews brings more light to it. You see, he had no lineage. He didn't have, uh, the, the interesting thing about the book of Genesis is that it always talks about people's lineage. And Noah begat so and so and so and so, and 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 Seth begat so and so and and so on and so and so, but when it comes to Melchizedek, you know, in Hebrews it tells us that he has no beginning or end. You know that uh, that he has no lineage. He has no beginning or end. Uh, Jesus has no beginning or end. Yeah. He says that he ministered to God, that he was a high priest of God. Now Jesus is our high priest before God, that he was that his kingdom was one of peace. Well, Jesus came to bring 
peace to mankind, reconciliation to mankind, and we can go on. And some people believe that he was a type of Christ, a shadow of what was to come. And other people believe that this was what is called a Christophany, which is a pre-incarnate revelation of Christ before his incarnation, before his virgin birth. Now, we can draw things from it in, in massive ways, but I want to say this, that, that in John chapter 8, in the New Testament, verses 56 to verses 58, it says this, it says, Jesus talking to the Pharisees, it says, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, You are not yet fifty years old. And have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And so, I don't know, I don't know if this was a pre-incarnate Christ, but I do know that this, that somewhere along Abraham's journey, Right, he said this that Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. And why the bread and wine? Because the bread and wine reminds us, doesn't it, of the new covenant. I wonder if revealed to him that day, he saw, he saw down the line God allowed him to see down the line to the day when Jesus Christ would become the new covenant the new covenant the righteous the righteousness of mankind the prince of peace that that he, met, he saw down the line and, and what's interesting also is that Abraham gave him an offering of the tenth a tithe of a tenth of all that he got. And, you know, some people say, well, tithings, tithings, you know, the old covenant. Well, let me say this. This is before the old covenant ever came into being that Abraham tithed to God, gave a tenth to God. Something was established there. You see, um, Abraham saw something of the future. And it says, you know, that uh, the king of Sodom came and offered him. He says, why don't you keep all of this stuff and, and I'll just take so-and-so. And, -so. and, and Abraham said, no, no, I have made an oath to the living God. And I believe that day that there was a choice that Abraham, Abraham to make, had to make choose you this day who you will serve because there was the king of Sodom and Gomorrah the king of Sodom and there was the king the righteous king of Salem yeah friends you know we have to choose who it is we're going to serve doesn't don't we and we we choose to serve the living God you know and after these the very next thing that, that God said to him in chapter 15, as we know it, it says this, After these things, the word of the Lord came to him again in a vision, saying, Do not fear, Abraham, I am a shield to you. Your reward shall be very great. I want to say that if we choose righteousness, God becomes our defender. If we choose the right place to stand with God that God becomes our Lord our Savior our deliverer our healer wow I want to just share one more thing with you very quickly that in that chapter as we move through it and he and he has this vision and God says to Abraham I want to make a covenant with you. Now, interestingly, covenant is normally, has an agreement on two parts. One part does this, the other part does that. 
and there's 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 that those conditions if you like attached to it but here we have a covenant that is totally reliant upon God God says doesn't say to Abraham if you do this I'll do that God says I am going to make a covenant with you where I will do it I will do it I promise I commit to it you don't have to do anything but I the living God will make this happen and so there was no condition attached for Abraham all that Abraham had to do was believe <laughs> and watch and see that God would do it you see God had just spoken to him within the vision. He said, look at the stars in the sky, how many they are, and your descendants will be the same. And, and he says, and God, and he believed in God, and God granted to him his righteousness. You see, he just had to believe in this covenant. And there's another covenant like it in the word of God, where we don't have to do anything. Right? We just have to receive the grace, the gift of God. And that is the covenant that was established through our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ upon, with his death upon the cross. There is no condition. It's by grace. It's by everything that God did. All we have to do is the same as Abraham had to do, is believe. And as we believe upon the Lord Jesus God, it is counted to us as righteousness in the same way. So Abraham <laughs> received the covenant from God, a covenant of promise that God would fulfill what he's done. And upon the cross, I want to say that God will fulfill what he accomplished upon the cross. For this purpose was the Son of God manifest. To destroy the works of the evil one. So today I want to leave us with this thought. Do we need to come to an altar of separation? Are there things that have slipped in our lives that have pulled us away from that, that walk with God? If so, then come back to him. And say, Lord... I'm going to separate myself from these things. Lord, I am committing to you today. Lord, I choose this day to follow you. I choose this day to have you as my Lord and Saviour in my life. Our God is a great God. He is so wonderful. You know, he died for us. He loved us that much that he died for us, that we might know what it is to have our sins forgiven and to have this covenant relationship in Jesus Christ. There's one more altar. There is one more altar that Abraham built. And we'll look at that next week. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you. The Lord give you his peace. I pray in Jesus' name.